I want to talk to you about terrain in the One Ring role-playing game, and specifically how I think that Terra Tiles happen to be a great terrain system for representing the physical terrain and physical situation in the game without getting too detailed. Because, as you know, I've been talking about in different videos about how much I enjoy a variety of different types of games. I enjoy the highly tactical games where you are moving all of your miniatures around square by square or hex by hex, I also enjoy the theater of the mind games, as they say, where you're not representing the physical situation at all on the table. You're just describing it to one another. I think you can also have a great time with that. But I've also been looking at a variety of different, what I'm calling hybrid systems, where you are using some type of representation on the table that shows a little bit about what the physical situation is with the terrain, but then you're also using some type of miniatures because a lot of us gamers have lots of miniatures, and so they're nice to put on the table and plus when you know if you're painting some of them a lot of people like to paint their PCs and get them on the table and you know it is a quick and easy way to communicate what the physical situation is, what the terrain basically looks like, where the PCs are, where the monsters are uh, on the table you know, really quickly by using some type of hybrid system that's someplace between, you know, the theater of the mind and then highly tactical games. And it seems like to me that the one ring role-playing game fits in that hybrid format. So let's take a look at combat in the one ring role-playing game and how we might use terra tiles and some miniatures to represent the physical situation during combat. Okay, it says, at the start of the battle, the sides involved in the confrontation are still separated by a distance, potentially allowing for a brief exchange of volleys using ranged weapons before combat at close quarters is initiated. The lore master must now determine how many volleys to allow, if any, based on the circumstances of the fight as defined at the onset. Under most circumstances, all combatants are entitled to at least one volley using a bow or thrown weapon, a spear or short spear. If the two sides are separated by a greater distance, then the lore master might allow combatants using a bow to let loose two volleys or even more. So I think if the game master is trying to set up some type of game using terra tiles for the one ring, it's really easy to say, okay, we're, let's, let's use the terminology from Fate. We'll call one of these hexes one zone. And that in most circumstances, the heroes and the bad guys would be separated by, let's say, a single zone when this starts. So I don't know. Let's say that the good guys, our adventuring party, are sitting over here on this rocky terrain. Maybe that's where they set up camp. And I've got some very nice Lord of the Rings themed miniatures over here. Say we got a couple of dwarves in this adventuring party, and then we've got this elf here who has a bow. Well, and then we also have this elf here who has uh, got sword and shields. We got two elves over here fighting, and then here are our orcs, and they are coming up over here. So this is just all of a sudden a very simple layout right here, but it does start to show you well, how would combat start. It's just two terra tiles, but you're seeing that, okay, we're starting combat here. The elf would get to attack uh, before we start close combat, and then probably these dwarves have throwing axes. So the dwarves would get to throw axes at these guys before we start to move the orcs, if the orcs are charging up, and move them into the same hex, and then we start the close combat round. If we want the elf to be able to shoot more with the bow, then we might do this with three terra tiles. Let's set this out like that, because this is a rather open ground, you know, open field right here. So maybe we've got these orcs coming out across this field, and all of our heroes are sitting over here on this, uh, this rocky outcropping. So now we've got a situation where the elf can shoot with the bow, and make a shot at these orcs, and then we resolve that, and then all of the orcs move forward again, and so now they're in this zone. We're not keeping track of where exactly they are in any particular zone. All that matters is that they're in the particular zone. Now they're here, now the elf gets to shoot again, and then the dwarves here who have their throwing axes get to throw their throwing axes against the orcs. Maybe that does take one of them out, and then by that time, then close combat begins over here on the uh, the rocky outcropping. And I think that's a great way to do it. 
It's very simple, it's very clean. We're not trying to go square by square in a really tactical situation, but it does show you generally how far the orcs are away. Hey, if we're two, then the guy with the bow can shoot. Once we get to one, well, here's the bow, and also let loose your throwing axes or throwing knives or whatever else it is you've got. And then, now we're moved into physical combat, and now it's time for the rest of the rules to start to apply. So, let's take a look at that. So, once the opening volleys are completed, the combatants cover the distance that separates them and begin fighting in close quarters. So, that's actually what we've got over here, and I think you can see both the book and a representation over here on this terra tile. So, we've got uh, three orcs and our heroes over here. Once fighting at close quarters is initiated, the gameplay is broken down into a cycle of rounds played one after the other until the end of the battle. The sequence of each close quarters round is explained on the next page. Surprise attack. A surprise attack happens when the company is ambushed by a foe or when the company succeeds in springing a trap upon unsuspecting enemies. If all sides involved in the combat are aware of the presence of the enemies, skip this phase. So basically, we didn't have a surprise phase here. We just had the, uh, the heroes seeing the orcs as they were running up to the rock. So let's just skip ambushed here. We get into close quarters round sequence. Each round fought at close quarters follows the sequence set out below. Stance, the company chooses their stances. Engagement, all combatants in close combat are paired with one or more opponents. Action resolution, the action of all combatants are resolved in stance order from forward to rearward. Okay, so stances here. And this is what's important for all of the heroes. All players select a combat stance for their heroes at the start of the round, choosing one of four available options. Adversaries do not choose stance. This rule portrays exclusively a player hero's point of view. So combat stances describe the attitude of a player hero during the combat round, from boldest to most cautious. There are three close combat stances, forward, open, and defensive, and one co ranged combat stance, rearward. The first three stances, open, forward, and defensive, allow a combatant to exchange blows in the thick of a fight using close combat weapons. The rearward stance is the only one that allows a player hero to make ranged attacks after the opening volleys. Heroes can freely assume any close combat stance at the start of the round, while the ranged combat stance can only be selected if a number of requirements are met. See its description. And I think that's where having the miniatures really help you out. Certain circumstances may result in the lore crafter allowing more player heroes to assume a rearward stance than would normally be possible. For example, if the company is fighting on a narrow ledge, a mountain path, or a similar feature which makes ranged attacks easier, the same reasoning applies to situations where the company outnumbers their opposition by at least three adventurers to one human-sized fighter. So, I've got another example here, like this right here. And this is one of the uh, river terrain tiles that we made in another video on the channel. So if we were, you know, looking here, and so we've got this situation. Well, and the orcs are coming in here. We could send maybe this elf because he's got a shield. Well, you know, maybe it's this dwarf because he's got an axe. Maybe this dwarf runs out here. So we've got this dwarf that runs out there. Oh, this guy actually has a bow as well, so he would have been able to shoot. And then we've got this elf here and then another orc here. Here is a circumstance where more of our heroes can adopt rearward stances because we've got this stone footbridge that's very easy to see that, hey, this uh, dwarf with the axe is uh, rushing forward to take care of these orcs which are attacking here. And then these two guys, this dwarf with a bow and this elf with a bow, would also be able to adopt rearward stances. And that's very easy to see on a tile like this that depicts the stream with the, the, the very narrow footbridge. So here's a situation where it's very easy to see what's going on if you use this hybrid approach with some terra tiles or some other kind of terrain system that kind of shows what's going on. So forward stance in close combat, this is the one where you seek to exploit any opportunity to attack to the point of exposing yourself to the retaliation of your enemies. This dwarf right here with this big uh, uh, two-handed axe is probably in the forward stance option. Open stance, you fight without sparing yourself but giving proper attention to your enemy's actions. Defensive stance, you fight conservatively, trying to protect yourself or others and holding your ground. Rearward stance, ranged combat, you stand away from the press of the fighting to attack your foes from a distance. You can attack your adversaries using only ranged weapons, and you can only be targeted by attackers using similar weapons. Player heroes are allowed to assume a rearward stance if the total number of enemies isn't more than twice the number of the adventurers in the company. Furthermore, for each player hero in rearward, there must be two other adventurers fighting in close combat stances. Okay, so that's interesting. So, and this is our special circumstance here, where we've got one guy 
in his forward stance that is fending off these orcs. We've got another one here, and so because we've got a constricted front here, we're able to have two guys here in the rearward uh, stance who would be able to shoot their missile weapons. Here, if they are just hanging out on this stony hill, and we've got three orcs that have run up, We've got our guy who is going to adopt a forward stance right here. This elf is a bit more cautious and, and uh, adopts an open stance. And then we've got this right here. Player heroes are allowed to assume a rearward stance only if the total number of enemies isn't more than twice the number of the adventurers in the company. Well, that's certainly the case here. We've got three orcs. We've got four uh, adventurers or three orcs that made it up there. So these guys would be eligible to be rearward by that uh, rule. But furthermore, for each player hero in rearward, there must be two other adventurers fighting in close combat. So this is where the, the miniatures really are nice because you can see, okay, so actually once these two get here, we should have had this guy shoot when they were approaching because he's got a bow. But assuming that he also has a short sword or something like that, both of these two characters can't take rearward positions here because there isn't enough fighters to uh, cover them. So maybe this dwarf goes up and starts to take this. So this would be a legal arrangement. Forward, open, and open, let's say, and then rearward here. And that does allow you to represent the situation quite effectively here and see who's allowed to be back and shooting with missile weapons and who's not. I like this system. I really like this system, by the way. So what's next? Once all players have determined their stance, all combatants fighting in close combat must engage one or more opponents, which is what we've uh, represented here. So we've got each hero fighting against one orc. And it says right here, using miniatures, cardboard stand-ups, or tokens to represent the player heroes and their opponents can speed this process up a lot, as we've been seeing by using some terra tiles and some miniatures, because, you know, we got miniatures. <laughs> we got tons of miniatures, so we might as well use them. As shown in the following paragraphs, how this plays out depends on the number of enemies compared to the total number of player heroes in the company. Since characters from either side can be killed, knocked out, or forced to leave the fight, altering the odds, the engagement process is likely to change from round to round. Engaged combatants remain as such until all opposition is defeated or until they leave combat. So since these three here have engaged, they will remain engaged until all opposition is defeated or until they leave combat. More enemies than player heroes. We're not in that situation. But we could be. I've got some other miniatures here. Maybe we've got this white here. He's pretty cool. So if we had the white here and another white and this, like, uh, some kind of ghostly orc or something like that here. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, we got six bad guys now. We got three, uh, four heroes. So in this kind of situation, when a round sees more enemies than player heroes, engagement is handled by the lore master as follows. The lore master assigns one opponent to each unengaged player hero fighting in a close combat stance. Then, for each remaining foe, the lore master chooses between engaging a player hero in close combat, stance who is already engaged, or standing back, possibly to attack using a ranged weapon. Enemies who stand back and use ranged weapons may attack any player hero involved in the, white, in the fight. So, we don't have um, orcs or uh, undead here with ranged weapons, so they'd probably go forward and start to attack these other engaged heroes here. But if they did have ranged weapons, they could attack anybody involved in the fight. We're not uh, worried, at least at this point, about you know firing into melee or something like that. More player heroes than enemies or sides equally matched. So in the first example, take away these, we do have more player heroes than enemies or sides equally matched. Player heroes in close combat stance choose an unengaged adversary to face. That's kind of what I did when I moved them forward from among the targets introduced by the lore master as eligible targets. If there are not enough free enemies to engage, player heroes in close combat left without an adversary may engage an enemy already engaged. If one or more of the company is fighting in rearward, it is possible that there will be enemies left when everyone engaged in close combat has engaged an adversary. If one or more of the company is fighting in rearward, like this elf here, it is possible there will be enemies left when everyone fighting in close combat has engaged an adversary. And I guess that would be the case if these four orcs did survive the missile attacks as they came in. So now we're in that kind of situation right there. 
If this happens, the lore master chooses whether the spare enemies, like this guy right here, engage a player hero who is already fighting in close combat stance or stand back to attack with ranged weapons. Well, he doesn't have ranged weapons. He's got a scimitar and a sword, so he might also come over here to this elf. It says engagement limits right here. Usually, player heroes can be engaged in close combat by up to three human-sized creatures or two large creatures, such as trolls. Heroes engaged by multiple foes choose which adversary to attack when it is their turn to attack. Conversely, up to a maximum of three player heroes may engage in close combat against a human-sized opponent at the same time, while up to six can engage an enemy greater than human size, such as a troll. When an enemy is engaged by multiple player heroes, the lore master chooses which opponent to attack when their turn comes. Then we start to get into resolving attack rolls and things like that, which really isn't the subject of this video. We went through the basics of resolving combat in another video, but uh, here we're just talking about resolving and, and actually representing the physical situation on the tabletop. So, you know, I, I think I would definitely want to play this game with some type of physical representation on the battlefield, and I feel like terra tiles would be a great option for that. Because they're flat, they're colorful, they've got a lot of uh, representation, though, about, you know, this, this path here, the rocks over here, the stream, the, the road. There's a lot of physical situation that can be represented with terra tiles just by putting out three or four of them. And it doesn't seem like that it takes all that much space to represent a one-ring battle. So two, three, you know terra tiles here when we were representing the orcs rushing up seems like all you need because once we get into close combat i mean assuming that you've got four or five maybe six different heroes inside the company and they're attacked by some number of combatants like that you're probably not going to need more than one or two tiles to represent all of that and the, the game does have rules about okay now how many people are up close versus how many people can be rearward and shooting bows so I definitely think that having some miniatures and having some uh, some terra tiles out to show how far away they are, how close they are, what the physical situation is, without getting down deep into the square by square stuff, which the One Ring is just not worried about that. And I like that about the system. So I would definitely call this kind of a hybrid system, and that uh, I think terra tiles are a fantastic way to represent that. What do you think? Do you agree, disagree? Do you use some other terrain system for the One Ring? Please let me know. Meanwhile, if you would like some terra tiles for your table, I am re-releasing these through GameFound. I will put the link down below so you can go over to the draft page of the GameFound uh, campaign and you can follow it there. You can see all the different uh, sets for terra tiles that I have and exactly what pieces are going to be in exactly what set and all the specifications and all of that. It's all there. So please click that and please check out the GameFound campaign page. And then also, please like, subscribe, and check out my YouTube channel. I've got a lot of other videos on tabletop and fantasy and gaming and all of that, all organized by playlist. So go over there, find a topic you're interested in, enjoy some videos, and I look forward to seeing you in a lot more videos to come. And until then, happy gaming.